Now, this next session is called Building Safety After Grenfell. We're going to be looking at what are the key recommendations from the Hackett Review and how we can go above and beyond them to lead the way in tenant safety. Uh, to talk to us, and then it'll be open to questions and discussion, uh, please welcome the Deputy Director, or our Deputy Director, at the Department of Housing, Communities and Local Government, Izzy Connell. Good morning. Uh, as Christian said, I'm one of the Deputy Directors for Building Safety Policy at MHCLG. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is to take you through um, how the Hackett review was arrived at, some of the key principles and recommendations from that review, tell you a little bit about what's, um, what's coming next, and then, as Christian said, open it up to the floor for, for some questions and a bit of a discussion on that. So, after the terrible tragedy at Grenfell Tower, as well as focusing very much on uh, the community in, in Grenfell and the surrounding area and also those issues around ACM cladding in other places. Also, quite quickly, government moved to focus on what was, what was wrong that led us to that situation. And at the end of July, the Prime Minister announced an independent review uh, of building regulations. And, and that was a review of the, the system itself with a focus on high-rise buildings, um, but very much looking at the end-to-end -end system, including not just the uh, initial planning permission and construction, but also right through to that occupation and maintenance phase that many of you in this room will have that particular interest in. The terms of reference for that review were published at the end of August. Um, and that, at the same time as that, the um, shortly after the public inquiry, uh, started um, sort of set up and started taking evidence. And at the same time, in parallel to that, and again, uh, specifically requested by the Prime Minister, uh, housing ministers, and through different iterations thereof, um, undertook a, a quite unprecedented um, level of uh, program of direct engagement with tenants um, with a view to creating the social housing green paper. And that involved meeting, I think, around 1,000 tenants around the country, as well as landlord events that I imagine many of yourselves may have been involved in again. So the, the process leading up to the interim report for Dame Judith Hackett for her independent review uh, included a call for evidence over September and October which uh, last year, which I imagine many of you would have responded to. S several, many, many bilaterals, round tables, including industry and also residents directly as well. And in December last year, she published her interim report. And that report really was a damning indictment of the system and pretty much all parts of it. And if you've heard Dame Judith speak about this, I think she's quite candid that she was quite shocked by some of the things that she found in that system. Um, there's, you, you will get copies of these slides because there's a fair bit of detail on some of them. But it was clear some of the things that, she, that really came out in that initial uh, report was that this was very much a broken culture uh, with a focus on cutting costs and even evidence of some gaming the system um, that residents weren't listened to, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, a very an ineffective regulatory system with a lack of real teeth to it. Um, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that all that doesn't mean that all buildings are unsafe. It doesn't mean that large numbers of, of buildings are unsafe. But it means that the, what she found was a complex system that's hard to understand, hard to enforce, and with the potential, as we've seen, for some really terrible outcomes. Now, don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's good that you can't read this slide. Um, this, was the, this is the system mapping that was created following the, the call for evidence and some work by the independent review team um, and, and with, with Dame Judith. And uh, hopefully some of you have seen this already before in the report. Um, it's an extremely powerful image, I think, without looking at that detail. It really demonstrates that complexity, that lack of join-up, and the challenges, therefore, for those who are trying to navigate those systems, for those who are trying to enforce within this system, and 
God forbid for any resident from the outside, not, in, not intimately involved in it, trying to uh, access and understand that th this system and how they can play a part in it. So following that uh, interim report in December last year, um, there was uh, a series of further engagement led by Dame Judith and kicked off uh, in a uh, summit called by the, um, the Home Secretary and the, the Minister for Housing. Um, there were a series of working groups. I think some, some of yourselves or your organisations might have been involved in those as well. Um, and then the final report was launched on the 17th of May this year. Um, it's quite a long report. There's 53 recommendations. Has anyone... How many people have actually read it? I think, given the length, I think that's pretty good going. The executive summary... I, I'm not going to ask for hands, but I imagine everyone's read the executive summary. Just keep, keep quiet if you haven't. Um, but 53 recommendations. It's a long report, but it's actually... Um, the executive summary is very accessible, and, and it's actually, for such a long report, it's really very readable. Um, but what, it, what it, it imagines is, a uh, crucially, a much stronger and tougher regulatory regime at the heart of this new system, this fundamental, re uh, fundamental reform that this uh, report recommends. Um, and that is a regulator that intervenes over the whole life cycle of the building. And that's right from that initial permissioning through to through all the stages in between and through to that occupation and maintenance um, state at the end, including refurbishments and right through to the very end of the life of the building. Um, and at each point within that, requiring that a, a high-rise residential building, and that's where this review is very much focused, is on those high-rise residential, um, that at every point it's demonstrated to be safe. So that envisages a new safety case regime, new roles and responsibilities, including a building safety manager role uh, within that occupation and maintenance phase, uh, and all of that being overseen by this new uh, joint competent authority, which is a national regulator with a local presence, and there's, there's an awful lot of really interesting but quite challenging work going on in order to kind of think through what that means in more, more detail. Then the report um, and this new system is also under, uh, underpinned by a fundamental overhaul of guidance, and you'll have seen some of that start to come through. Uh, some of that work has already begun uh, within government, so on the 18th of June, uh, we published a consultation on banning the use of combustible materials uh, in cladding. And on the 19th of July, launched a consultation on clarification of approved document B, which is the one about fire. Um, so some of that has already begun. Um, it also, also underpinned by industry-led work and a real challenge to industry to improve competence of its, profession, its, of its professions and trades and come back with a credible proposal within a one-year time frame. And that work is ongoing at the moment. Also a focus on products, labelling, traceability, and also a very strong focus on empowering residents, and we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, now, across all of those key recommendations in the report uh, are some really clear, a really clear set of principles, and they are focused very much around accountability and responsibility. So holding duty holders, setting out clear responsibilities, holding those duty holders to account through this regulatory system, um, and a real outcomes-based approach. So a focus on looking at a building as an individual and unique system and requiring those people who have a duty to manage that building appropriately or build that building appropriately to prove that what they're doing is right and safe for that building. Um, there's... Dame Judith set out a, a clear red line for her that um, adding more prescription on its own into guidance isn't the way to do things, that the system, her report, she views as a package. It needs to be implemented uh, as a package and as a whole, and that we need that full system reform rather than tinkering at the edges. And this focus on accountability is key to moving away from what she found in that, very, in that interim report back last year of that race to the bottom 
that she described where everyone's trying to find the cheapest way and the easiest way to get around what level of prescribed requirements there are. And Dame Judith also set out a very clear challenge, both in her interim report and in her final report, that there's a lot that, uh, that industry, that all sectors involved in this whole system uh, can do to, to uh, make change in their own organizations and in that system now uh, before that stick that we see as, as necessary, but before that stick of a new regulatory regime comes in. So this is the nicer picture to look at. Um, so again, you don't need to be able to, to read. Um, and it's still not, you know, it's not four boxes, this new regulatory system that Dame Judith um, envisages. It still has a level of complexity. Um, but the key message in the comparison between that mapping that the review team did and the system that Dame Judith envisaged is it's much simpler, it's much clearer in terms of what's happening and what the accountabilities are. There's less potential for confusion, for conflation, for obfuscation of responsibilities. Uh, and this is, uh, that's really key to her vision for that new system. So, Dame Judith's report set out that case for system change, and it set out that framework for a new system. Uh, ministers, uh, immediately after the, the publication of the report, accepted that broad analysis of system failure and committed to bringing forward legislation. Um, but despite being a long report, um, there's an awful lot of detail still to work through. So within MHCLG, we've created the building safety portfolio. Um, this is, uh, again, there's a lot of words on this picture, but it's, it's the arrows that are worth, worth having a look at. And this is about setting the future state that our portfolio of work is seeking to deliver. So that's an effective regulator and regulatory framework. Um, so that's uh, clearer sanctions, uh, stronger enforcement, proactive safety case approaches where people have to proactively demonstrate the safety of their buildings. Uh, it's about clear and effective standards and guidance, and I spoke a little about some of the consultations that are out or have recently closed um, that are part of that work of, of making that guidance that we issue centrally uh, clearer and more effective. It's about industry behaviors, and some of that has to be industry-led, and there's a lot of work going on within individual sectors about competence, uh, but it's also about information, provision information sharing, and that golden thread, as Dame Judith expressed it, the information that everybody who's involved in constructing or managing the building needs to know about the building as it was designed, as it was constructed, as it's being maintained and lived in, that enables yourselves and your organizations to manage those buildings properly and sensibly uh, and safely. Um, residents' voices being heard uh, and making a difference in that system, and I know that's something that is close to the hearts of lots of people here, um, and not losing that focus on, on uh, making sure that buildings are safe and say, stay safe. It's a long journey on some of this work on remediation, and other things will come up at other times. No system is, uh, is foolproof and is going to be problem-free, and we need to have a system that uh, can react to that and put, uh, put problems right, make them safe quickly. Um, so we'll be working through that detail. Uh, it takes time. Uh, some of it requires legislation. And there'll be further lessons, potentially, that we'll need to, uh, to think about and incorporate into our thinking as the public inquiry progresses, of course, as well. So one of the, the key lessons um, and key messages coming out of the, of the report is that residents' voices have been, to some extent, lost from the system. And a number of social landlords um, have been quite frank in some of their conversations with us that they recognize that that's been, become true in their own organizations uh, in the period leading up to Grenfell as well, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, and that that's something they recognize and are seeking to address now. Um, we're working through, as we work through this new system, we're also committed within MHCLG in thinking about how we bring the voice of residents into our own policy making, which is why we've created, uh, an, in the process of creating a residence reference panel for early testing of some of our policy development within the program. Um, and that's not just focused on 
asking residents about resident engagement, um, but asking residents and hearing their voice more broadly across the portfolio of work. Uh, and we're also working with early adopters within the housing association sector and others as we think through and test uh, and, and start uh, thinking about how we can make sure we make good legislation and a good system, but also see what we can do in advance of that. Um, and that's the challenge for all of us and for all of you, and it's Dame Judith's challenge, but it does bear repeating, um, that we can take action now. We can take action on resident engagement, uh, on the information that we provide to residents, on accountability within our own organizations, things like uh, building safety manager roles and thinking through what that might mean within our own organizations. And a lot of those things, um, I know of what, of what we all have thought about as good housing management, but it's a real renewed focus on some of that good practice. Um, so I know you've been hearing separately about the Social Housing Green Paper, but I thought it would be useful to explicitly make the links between the Hackett work and the Social Housing Green Paper work. As I mentioned earlier, they, their genesis was, um, was in the same terrible events. Um, the Social Housing Green Paper obviously goes, uh, published last, last month, as you know, it goes a lot um, broader than just talking about safety, to talk about, talk about supply, talk about stigma, um, uh, and is, uh, is, a, is a broader document than that. Um, but it has a real focus within it on quality, on safety, and on the resident's voice in the system. There's a lot of uh, synergy, and we've been working quite closely within, within the department on that. Um, and again, it's asking some searching questions for, for providers as to what you can do within your own organizations. So before opening up to questions, I'd like to leave you with, with those two challenges. Um, one is to continue to work with us as we design this new system uh, and make sure that the system we design is one that works for your sector and is one that works for residents. And the other is the challenge to take action in your own organizations before legislation um, and before a new regulatory regime comes in. Um, culture change, as we all know, takes, takes time. It takes a really long time. Um, and starting now and thinking about how you lead your organizations through that um, is, is massively important and a massive opportunity for this sector. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would you like to come and have a, have a seat? Um, you can enter questions through Slido, or you can just put your hand up uh, <laughs> and make a point, or just Depends if you want to let anyone know attention. it was your question. That, 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 would be, that would probably be better, I think, in a room this size, to be honest, if you'd like to, uh, to just ask a question. I mean, cultural change, which you talked about mm. at the end there, is such a big part of the post Grenfell uh, change that's required, isn't it? I mean... What can a ministry do about that? So that's a really interesting question and a really challenging question. I've just poured you a glass of water Thank there as much. well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only polite. <laughs> um, so that's a really um, challenging and interesting question. And it's actually, happily, it's part of my brief within the department. Um, my team focuses on resident voice and uh, industry culture change. Um, we have recently launched an early adopter scheme, and there are um, some, some housing associations explicitly involved in that. Um, Salix, l and and Peabody at the moment are working closely with us on that. Um, and that, uh, the vision for that scheme is that it is organizations, both associations but others involved in kind of construction or maintenance um, and, and uh, development, um, that those organizations work quite closely with us both to inform good policy development but also to actively demonstrate that action can be taken in advance of that legislation and act as credible voices within their own industry championing some of that change. Some of it is much more credible coming from within a sector. People saying we've, we've been through this ourselves, we're doing it, we're leading it. Um, we'll always have a different sort of power from government telling people what to do. Um, so I think that's really quite valuable. But I think we are eager to hear 
your ideas and to learn from the lessons of other sectors that have had to go through some of this. Dame Judith, those who've read the interim report will have been, I imagine, struck as I was by Dame Judith's comparison with her time at HSE and a culture that at the beginning, when she, uh, at the beginning, sort of uh, operated on the basis of people die on building sites, and that's the way it is. And turning that, I speak, I speak loosely, um, but turning that around to a, a culture where uh, there is a, there are very few deaths on building sites, that's gone down dramatically, accidents have gone down dramatically. Um, the, the view in the report is that that requires that tough regulatory stick, and that's certainly what happened with health and safety on building sites, that you need the regulator side. But I think what we would like to say, see is both sides of that. So we would like to see leadership of people saying, we can do this well and better, and actually, you know, if you get, if you get safety right at the beginning of the process, then you, have, you don't have costs later down the process when you realize something's gone wrong. So demonstrating it can, it, work, it can work in a positive way, but I think we do recognize there needs to be the regulatory stick as well. Who would like to raise something? Yes. I don't know, are there microphones in this room or? Just here. Hi, uh, Chris Page from our Walton Housing Association. Um, I just, uh, I find the discussion of Grenfell so frustrating mm. uh, because when I saw that building burning on that morning, I just thought, oh my God, we've wrapped a building in flammable material. And it seems to have this massive discussion about regulation and tenant voice and all the rest of it. And it seems very simple that how do we get to a situation where we allowed, you know, something of limited combustibility uh, to be put on a tower block? And I, I can't, I'm not getting a sense of an answer to that question because that seems to me, you know, that you know, going way back, there's something wrong with how we're making those decisions. I think that's definitely Dame Judith's analysis, is that there is, that the system has not worked, the system has been broken, and it has not had the, it's not had the accountability, it's not had the focus on safety, that um, change control is loose, uh, what's designed at the beginning is not necessarily what's built, information, about the nature of the, the building that's crucial to taking decisions is just doesn't exist, hasn't been kept and held. And the accountabilities, there's no, people will take responsibility for what they're subcontracted to do for little elements, but there's been a lack of somebody taking ownership for decision making and for the building as a whole. And what Dame Judith's uh, analysis and future system seeks to do is to very much address those things so give very clear accountabilities require that golden thread of information require people at regular intervals even during occupation and maintenance to actively prove that they're building as a whole with what it's got on it now and what they're planning to put on it and in it and everything else that that is safe um, so that that's a fundamental change of the system with an entirely new regulatory regime that spans that whole life cycle rather than uh, into different bodies being able to intervene at different you know, HSE and planning permission um, while things are planning permission while it's being built HSE on site building control uh, local authority environmental health when it's HHSRS you know a really um, divided system of accountability both in the enforcement sense and also within the organizations making the decisions as to what to do with their buildings um, so it's not a it's not a quick fix to that problem um, but it it is very much addressing those those issues and what led to that terrible tragedy um, but I think Dame Judith is very clear in her analysis that just banning combustible cladding by itself isn't the answer um, just adding new prescriptions won't change a system that fundamentally doesn't have the right requirements for keeping information, for change control, for active uh, accountability and responsibility. And is the system still going to be different for different story so buildings? This is, this is focusing on um, HRRBs, is the acronym, so high-rises. Um, but hasn't but that definition changed as well? 
So there's a definition suggested by the report. There's a lot of, so there's a, there was a listening exercise that was conducted, so an invitation to put in views um, on the report immediately after that closed, I think at the end of July. There are a lot of views about where that threshold should be. Um, and that's, that's an issue that the department's thinking about at the moment. But uh, Dame Judith does certainly envisage a dynamic regulator that has the ability to shift what that threshold would be depending on, on evidence. So it does very much seek to avoid a situation where you put the threshold there and everybody tries to build just, just under. under. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Hi, uh, Luke Barrett, Inside Housing. Um, why do you think the DCLG, as it was then, um, didn't act in July 2014 when it was warned specifically um, that its guidance was allowing the exact type of cladding that was used on Grenfell? So is this Lacknell House? No, um, this is a reference to a meeting in July 2014 between um, DCLG and the um, cladding, the, what are they called? The, um, Centre for Window and Cladding Technology, um, in which officials from the department were told specifically that aluminium cladding with a polyethylene core was being allowed by the guidance in approved document B and suggested that it be changed. So I, I think there, I know that this, that uh, different people have espoused different views and the, there is a <laughs> clarification of approved document B out for consultation at the moment, but I think we, we believe that approved document B would not have allowed that it does not allow that ACM cladding on those high rises. I think Dame Judith does, does state very clearly that there are real issues about clarity of guidance and understanding of guidance, but the guidance does not allow that. There's, there's been problems in the, the system has not worked and that has got on buildings um, and it shouldn't have done, but the, it's not what the guidance Allow, it's not what the guidance says should should be. Why didn't they clarify that? I think that's probably a bit beyond your. It's, scope I'm to afraid be it on, is beyond it? my my personal expertise to get. I, I don't have the note of the meeting, or so we. If you want to follow up with the department, then you can. Okay, but you, I'm sure you've asked people. You have who tried, have been, you say. Yeah, we, we published stories about this And what response have you had? Find it and come back to us in a second. We'll take this question here. Hi, because we can talk about cladding probably for the rest of the day. Uh, I suspect we talk about this entire subject for the rest of the day. My name's Jan Taranchuk, uh, member of the Institute of Housing and currently helping London Borough of Ealing on fire safety. I'm a housing manager, not a fire safety expert, because um, they seem to be in quite short supply at the moment. Um, talking about the resident's voice, which is clearly part of your, your interest, I'm interested in two things. One, why the that your pilot or your reference panel um, doesn't have a, a local authority. They're all, they're all housing association. I know this is a housing association party, but I wonder why local authorities have not been invited to be part of that, that group. And secondly, that quite clearly, we need to share information with residents. The challenge for most people in this room as landlords is the information to be shared with residents quite often is not available to them as landlords in the first place or in one place. So the whole technological process of storing information mm. and making out information available, easily accessible to residents is going to be, I would suggest, a major challenge for us all. Yeah. Because there won't be an asset manager in the building who isn't able to swear that he knows or she knows everything about the building under the current um, yeah. the 3000 HRRBs. And so that building services manager, this person who's going to have the name, the licensee name above the door, um, which is going to be a, a, a job killer, I suspect. Um, there is nobody in the country who has got the, the qualifications to have all of the information for that one person. And has there been some discussion as to how or where that information... Can, so, two things. Where's the information going to come from to assist the building services manager do their job? Are we clear about who the duty holder is going to be? And how on earth are we as an industry going to provide information to residents 
that we ourselves haven't yet got ourselves. Thank you. So I think I would, to some extent, reflect the challenge back on information. If, you, if you're managing a building that you don't feel you have the information that you require to manage that building safely, then I would challenge you very strongly to think about what information you need and how you might get that. If it's information that you don't think is necessary, because um, I, can see, I can see you shaking your head. Uh, I didn't say I didn't, we didn't have it. I said making it available in one place mm. is the challenge. So, so I think um, that's a challenge that if I was, if I was responsible, if I was, um, if I was senior management or a board member within an, an association or a council or a, a private sector body owning, owning a high-rise building, I would very much want to know that the person managing that building had that information in an accessible format. And I imagine that that is the same, that, that others would agree with that. So I think you're right, there's a challenge in doing that. But I think that I would challenge you all to be doing that anyway in advance of that legislation because it's important to be able to manage those buildings properly. Um, as to the, the duty holder role, the building safety manager role, these are, these are some tricky questions and we will be consulting on on that regime and where that kind of where those duties and responsibilities should appropriately be held um, but I think you the building safety manager role as you say uh, spans a large variety of um, of areas you won't be able to have expertise in all of those areas but you in the same way as somebody managing a property now wouldn't necessarily be an accountant or a solicitor and would need to bring in expertise. The building safety manager would need to bring in some of that safety expertise from, from the right bodies and competent people. Thank you, yes. Uh, Izzy, um, uh, Jared Coots is my name. I've, I've got an Australian accent, as you may hear. Um, I'm here from Melbourne um, uh, and I was the immediate past chair of the Building Appeals Board in Victoria um, up until 12 months ago. Um, the Victorian Building Authority estimate that there's between five and 10,000 buildings in Melbourne alone um, of combustible cladding. Mm. Um, the Victorian Building Authority, uh, the board that I chaired was independent of the uh, authority and the authority seems to have very little um, enforcement powers to um, force the removal of the cladding. Um, there's been one major building contractor in Melbourne that's uh, taken the authority to the Supreme Court and uh, won against uh, the authority to actually remove the cladding. Um, is the UK government looking at a fund um, to, um, I guess, fund the removal? Um, and I'm just kind of interested in um, learning how the UK government um, expect to estimate the cost of that removal and whether there's, um, I guess, expectations that building contractors will go bust as a um, outcome of the process. Sorry, it's a, such a long-winded question, but it's, uh, it's very interesting because I, I know our buildings, uh, building surveyors and fire engineers are deeply watching what's happening here in the UK just to kind of understand what so, they might so do. I, I think there's a quite a complex answer to that that varies in different sectors as well, but perhaps especially because I see we've just run out of time for the session, perhaps we can have a word and I can take your details and we can kind of follow that up separately. But okay. broadly the answer is no, um, there is no But broadly, there. well, the position is very different in the social sector from the private sector, so there is uh, substantial funding has been set aside for the social sector and I think all the um, applications for that I think applications have gone in for that funding. The situation in the private sector is, is different and there is not, there's an expectation that um, those responsible will pay for that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're out of time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Izzy, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you.